I would say what prepared me the most for the work that I do right now was the desire to learn how to replicate music. Let's say there was a song that I loved. Let's say, I don't know, Jump by Van Halen, <laughs> right? That's a song that I grew up with. I knew everything about that song. Like I knew the keyboard part. I would pay attention to what the bass was doing. I knew what the drum fill was doing. So I had this picture in my head about what that song sounded like. So then I felt the need to learn how to play all those things. When I was in high school, I had a Korg O1WFD, which was one of the first keyboards that had a built-in sequencer on them. So picture trying to make a sequence, not on a DAW, not on a computer screen, but rather a screen that was this big, <laughs> but you had to hit your cursor just to quantize something. You know, you had to hit a cursor 25,000 times. It, it was it was hard. It took It was very time consuming, but I loved it. My God, how I loved it. Because here I was recreating Rush songs, Zeppelin songs, and on my keyboard, figuring out the bass part from the track, uh, you know, on my cassette player, and transcribing it on my own, and learning how to play it on the keyboard, like learning how a bass part feels under my fingers, learning how a drum part feels under my fingers, and breaking it down. Um, so that just came from a, a, a curiosity that I always had, but also just a love that I had for arrangement, even though I didn't know that it was a love for arrangement. I often tell people many times I would buy sheet music to popular songs. And if the sheet music didn't have the guitar solo written out, I would transcribe the guitar solo. And it wasn't always a transcription where I would write down the notes on staff paper. I would just like transcribe on my own or learn how to play it. Um, and one thing I would offer advice is that it's amazing that in this day and age, getting isolated stems is so easy to do and seeing transcriptions already done for you is so easy, but I got to tell you, doing it on your own, there's no substitute for that. Because while I could look at a great Bill Evans solo and like try to play it that way uh, because someone's already done the work for me, it's very different than just sitting there and committing to memory and really listening and using your ears and using your brains and your fingers to try to replicate something and do the trial and error. Because I think the mistakes you make along the way is what actually teaches you. That's how you learn. You realize, oh, that's not the interval. Oh, that's not the phrase. And then you got to hit those walls and bump your head a couple of times before you achieve this discovery. And in that, you become a stronger musician. Your ear gets stronger. Your playing gets stronger. I grew up in a world where it wasn't so easy to get all those transcribed parts. So I had to do it on my own. I think all that really prepared me for orchestration, for arrangement, because I feel like I know what those instruments do really well because I've listened to the greats, right? I've listened to Getty play the bass. I've listened to Bottom play the drums. I, I know what, what the, the benchmark is. So when I'm writing charts, I'm just trying to write a guitar part and it's half as cool <laughs> as something a, a real true guitarist would play. So really, it's just chasing that dream. I've always tried to make the piano sound like an orchestra when I play it. And when I play it, I try to have my left hand replicate the drums you know, with the pinky being the kick drum and the thumb being the snare if I'm playing octaves, right? That's a lot of Billy Joel, Elton John stuff that, that I get. And then I think it's about trying to make the piano just cover all the bases. How do you do comping, but also have fills at the same time? How do you do both? So I, I think if I'm trying to condense an arrangement for a piano, I think the main thing for me is how can the piano rhythmically get the vibe because there are some songs that rely so heavily on drums. And what do you do? Like, how do you, you make that happen? Like, let's just say you have four bars of drums. Let's say My Hero by Foo Fighters. It's just drums for, for eight measures, at least. I would try to find a way to do that on the piano. I don't know that I would bang the sides of the piano necessarily, but maybe I'd come up with a little melody. Don't pound up, don't get, don't get, don't get, get in octaves, or go bump up and bed or bed on, da da and da da da. What's the way to get that across and be a little creative to get that that feeling going? Or do you stop the floor? Do you find some way to verbalize that? Um, and then you just try to find out, okay, what's the melody that you're going to hook onto? try to put that in the right hand. Oftentimes, I might try to find ways to have uh, the melody in the pinky of my right hand and then voicings underneath it, either to support that melody or be contrapuntal to that melody or be some kind of chordal comping against that melody. And sometimes you have to just ignore 
certain parts because you only have 10 fingers and you have to make decisions about what is the thing that's really going to give the best picture of the vibe of the song, the sound of the song. That just comes from years of me wanting to cover it all and, and being so enamored with what the guitar player does in a band, what the bass player does in a band. So it's not enough for me to just do just the keyboard part. I find that boring. I'd rather be a one-man band because I love all those instruments. So I'm basically trying to condense all these instruments that I love into 88 keys. My keyboard setup at home is pretty minimal. I've got an 88 key weighted keyboard uh, that slides under my desk. I've got an iMac uh, that's pretty souped up, I think. And I've got two Genelec speakers next to me. And I've got my Apollo interface to my left. That's basically my rig. I, I go through all of that stuff to, to give me what I need. For me, the tech aspect is so ingrained into what I do creatively. I love that the tech aspect for me is extensions of things that I did the manual way when I was younger. For example, I used to transcribe with a paper and pencil and stack paper and write it all out. I uh, used to make tracks on my four track cassette player where I had to play the drum part live on a keyboard and then play the bass part live and do several takes. And also, again, I come from the world where if you got a good take and you thought you could do better, you better nail it because you're not going to be able to go back to your old take. You would record over the take and lose what you had before. So it was a gamble. You had to kind of call it when you were like, you know what? I peaked. I'm not going to get better than this. So that was a, a cool place to be in. I think you develop an ability to um, judge and critique your own work or other people's work as well. Because through trial and error, you're able to place your bets better. You're able to say, you know what? It's not going to get better than that. Leave it. You're able to know when you kind of like passed a hump and you've got into the law of diminishing returns. Uh, and that's when you know you have to leave it. So I say this because now, obviously, finale has made things so much easier. Now, mind you, when I was at Berkeley, I was the cat who stayed up all night handwriting parts for my big band charts, one part at a time, hours upon hours upon hours, learning how to lay out music to make sure it looks good, learning how to be legible so they can understand what I was writing, and getting the experience of having to transpose in my head, having to write out a trumpet part and automatically transposing a whole step up. Obviously, the tech now in Finale and Sibelius, it does all that stuff for you, and it is really nice not to have to worry about that, but I feel lucky that I once had to worry about it because I don't take it for granted. And it, again, made me a better musician. Same thing with sequencing. I love that now you can do takes upon takes upon takes of vocal passes. Uh, but then when you're in the studio getting those performances, you know when to push, you know when to let it go, you know when to give that actor or that performer that one extra note that might make that take better. Or you know when, hey, it's actually not improving, we've, we've got to let it go, and then you move on. I do rely on the tech aspect because I feel like that's what makes my work speedier, cleaner, better, more versatile. But at the same time, I, I'm grateful that I learned the hard way growing up. I started using Finale when I got to Berkeley in 1993, and that was the early days of it. Uh, I still use Finale to this day. I can poke around a Sibelius, but I'm really terrible at it. When I was at Berkeley, I learned to use Vision. Uh, that was the software at the time, Opcode's Vision. I eventually moved over to Logic, but this was after Apple had bought Logic. I used to find Logic really hard to understand. It was The interface was really like very utilitarian and not very sexy. <laughs> the only thing about it was just very chunky and blocky. I could not figure anything out. And then all of a sudden, Apple came along and then Logic became like beautiful and gorgeous and aesthetic and pleasing, much more my speed. So now I'm a Logic user. And I recently became fluent in Pro Tools because I had to learn Pro Tools for all the TV film stuff I was doing. So I'm happy to say I'm bilingual in both Logic and Pro Tools. I have used MainStage. I can poke around in that. Um, but in terms of sounds for keyboard samples, I love Keyscape. I think it sounds fantastic. I use Contact a lot. Uh, Spitfire is my go-to for orchestra samples, for uh, symphonic sounds. I really love that. Scarby makes great bass sounds, so I love that. Real Guitar is fantastic. Great samples there. And I have a, a Universal Audio 
for my uh, interface. So they've got great plugins, great reverbs, great compressors, all that stuff. I love the soft tech versions of the hardware things, like the tube tech amps, uh, the, the Marshall amps that are simulators. Like again, like it's come such a long way from when we were when I was growing up. So uh, be grateful <laughs> is all I'll say. Yeah, that, that's my go-to uh, apps and stuff that I use. I don't do a ton on my phone. I don't like create voice memos very often and transcribe that stuff. I tend to go directly into the logic of Pro Tools to record and stuff there. I find one of the challenges for me is staying current, particularly if what's out there isn't necessarily resonating with you in the same way that it might have with other styles. I try to find value in whatever it is that I'm listening to. I got this great advice from my friend. Like He would say, man, if I'm in the car and there's a song that I don't like on the radio, I don't switch stations. I actually turn it up. I actually like try to challenge myself to figure out, okay, what is it about this that I'm missing? What is it about this that people are, are really digging that it, it, I, that I'm not digging? So I feel like there's some merit to any piece of art out there. There's something to be found. And I, I try to find what that is. And I try to make myself love it because as an arranger and orchestrator, you have to love the song you're working on. If you don't love it, I don't believe you're going to be able to necessarily come up with a really exciting chart for it. So because of that, you have to find ways to figure out, okay, what is it about this that that works for me? What is my in? What is what's going to connect me to this piece of music that is going to allow me to do work that I could be proud of? I try to just check out music. I, I consciously, in the morning, if I don't know what I want to listen to, I'll go to Apple Music and find out what the hits of the day are. I'll listen to it. I'll follow along with lyrics. I'll look at who the writers are. I'll pay attention to the production. I'll really just try to get in there and take it apart so I can figure out how to stay hip, how to <laughs> stay with the curve so that when time comes and people ask me to arrange something with a style that I might not be as in love with, I'm at least familiar with it. And that will allow me to be a part of it. Lately, what's bringing me joy in my life is actually taking time to relax. And I know that sounds like such a crazy thing because we're so programmed to work, 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 and to produce and, and to, to make things. But I am learning how important it is to recharge. I'm learning how important it is to have downtime, uh, to have a social life, to spend time with my wife, to pet my cat, to be out in nature. Unplugging is, is one thing that has been bringing me joy lately, as is cooking, you know, finding hobbies outside of music. But in terms of music, lately, I've been finding in joy in discovering music of my youth that I didn't listen to. For example, just this morning, I was listening to the Pixies' Surfer Rosa. I knew Doolittle a little bit, but I'm listening to this and I'm thinking to myself, man, I wish I had heard this album when I was 13 when it came out. It might have changed the trajectory of my life perhaps a little bit. For me, that's a little bit of nostalgia, a little bit of just trying to get in touch with something that I feel like I missed. And just continuing to try to learn, whether it's listening, like I said, to podcasts about the making of an album that I love, to listening to Mahler, uh, you know, because I've been driving more often. Sometimes my drives will be an hour and a half to two hours. So for a little while there, I was making myself listen to Mahler symphonies in their entirety because I never really went down that path. So that came out of meeting with certain musicians who I know respect Mahler very highly. And that made me realize, hey, there's something that I'm uh, not on. There's a, a wavelength that I need to get on. So I just want to educate myself in that way. So really, it's about trying to amass more information in the hopes of making me more well-rounded, to give me more ideas, to see things from a different angle, which will only serve me in the work that I do. What is it that makes you you? What is it that makes you stand out and unique? Uh, I, I find that a hard thing to answer. All I know is uh, these are the qualities about myself that I'm proud of. I'm proud that I love music so much. I am grateful that I am a positive thinking person, that I find myself to be a glass half full type of cat. And because of that, I find the joy in music. For me, it's called playing music and I really try to lean into the play part of it. Because of that, I feel like there's also a um, space that I leave for other people because I do love when you get to commune with others about some song that you love, some artist that you love, some tune that you can jam on, that there's connection in that. Because when music is totally solitary, when you're in your practice room shedding, that's not the fun part for me. The fun part is performing. The fun part is playing with others and 
getting feedback in real time and talking about something that you love and, and discussing that piece of art together. Because of that, I feel like I treat other musicians with respect. I feel like I try to lift other musicians up around me, particularly if something is not coming out the way I hear it in my head. I try to make it work. I try to be like, okay, try this, try that. What about this angle? What about that angle? Or what about that rhythm? I try to um, gently encourage others to be their best selves, as opposed to turning my back on them, as opposed to giving up. Now, there are times, obviously, you have to make that tough call because try as you might, something might happen and something might not click. And you can tell that it's not going to be the smoothest of rides. Those are difficult moments. And I try to find the humanity of the people on the other side. During those moments, I try to be kind. I try to be respectful. But I also try to keep the project in mind. Um, uh, I try to do what's best for the piece even at the cost of sleepless nights, even at the cost of, of potentially uh, breaking hearts from time to time. I think the best advice I got was nonverbal advice. There were times at Berkeley where I auditioned for certain ensembles or classes that I didn't get into. And that humbled me because I grew up being a little bit of a, a, a big fish in a small pond. And I thought stuff was just always going to come to me because things had always felt easy to me. And it's not that I didn't work because I worked my butt off, but once I realized, hey, I'm really not at that level, that made me rethink what my goals were. That made me realize, hey, do I really want this? Like, How much do I want to shed this style of music or do I want to go there or do I want to pivot? Do I want to find what resonates for me? So when I didn't get that class, I thought to myself, oh, wait, I I'm not that hot that I thought I was. I, I uh, it, it woke me up. And I needed that. It needed uh, to just be brought down from this cloud that I was up on. So I'm thankful that I didn't get in. And I didn't deserve to be in because there were other writers who were better than I was. And there were people that I didn't know about. And that also humbled me as well because I realized, hey, it's there's a lot of people out there in this biz that you don't know about at all who are way stronger than you at this skill. And you have to respect that.